what is love? It isn't a noun. Love is not a thing. You don't possess love. You don't keep love in a jar on your shelf so when people come over, you can pull it down and say, look, this is my love. Isn't it pretty? No. Love is a verb. Uh, a lot of you saw that news story that was uh, going on. How many of you saw that? Uh, one place or other, it made some national news. Uh, I have the guy that you just saw right here this morning and uh, some great surprises. So Joe, Kathy, Timber, will you come on up here? Joe and Kathy have been part of our Camus campus uh, and very faithful and great workers and so we've had a lot of wonderful relationship and uh, we're, we're excited uh, just to know you and, and to see uh, how God has used you in, in this situation. I want to talk a little bit about it. You guys were out there um, kayaking and uh, what happened? Well, um we actually weren't planning on being there at that time. We were going to go later in the day, but we heard the weather was going to turn bad, so we went up earlier than we expected. And I actually was in my kayak. Kathy and Timber were on shore. And, you know, God made it happen. Um, he actually put a storm over Smith & Morehouse Reservoir, which forced me back to the marina. And I was actually in the marina about 20 yards off the boat ramp when I saw a pickup truck uh, just rolling down the boat ramp and went into the lake. And the father, and there were three, I didn't know there were three kids, I thought there were two. Uh, the one nine-year-old boy was able to, thank God, open the rear passenger door of the truck and get out. The grandfather actually, as the truck was going under, the two-year-old, the two uh, what's her name? Brianna, she came out of the truck, and I truly think there was a third child in the, in the vehicle, nine-year-old Paxton. And I truly believe Paxton threw her out of the truck. Uh, at that point, the truck was, went totally submerged. It was about 8 to 10 feet underwater. Uh, praise God, um, the first child, Jack Lucas, sorry, my brain is. Um, Lucas was able to open the rear passenger door because all the other doors were closed. Um, the, the truck was fully submerged. The water bill, I couldn't see the truck, but I was able to see the bubbles from where the truck was coming up. Um, so I dove down first. I found the passenger mirror, front passenger mirror of the pickup truck, so I knew I had to go two doors back. I swam back. I think, I, I don't know if I came up for air at that point, but long story short, I dove down, I think three times on that side, trying to search the cab of the truck. I couldn't see anything. Went around to the driver's side. Those doors were locked. I tried breaking a window with punching it, which is futile underwater. Um, long story short, I dove back to, to the, uh, the, the passenger side door. I dove in either once or twice, and I finally found clothing. I grabbed them. And I uh, swam backwards out of the truck, got to the surface. Uh, my wife, was, she was right there the whole time. She was in the water with me. She had her life jacket on, of course. And every time they come up, she's like, you get back down there. You get back down there. So <laughs> not that I was going to give up anyway, but a little bit of encouragement from my wife. So uh, we went to shore and praise God, Timber, the two-year-old went to Timber and Timber took care of the two-year-old for about two hours probably. The, father, the grandfather who actually got the two-year-old out of the truck literally was starting to go under himself. He threw the baby to my wife, and then my wife gave it to Timber. So she took care of the baby for, uh, for about two hours. Um, and, she, you know, God was there, man, I'll tell you, because we got 911 at Smith & Morehouse Reservoir. You never get a cell phone at Smith & Morehouse, and we got them, which, which sped up the response time. They were there within 15 minutes once we got them out of the water. So we got him on the boat ramp, myself, my wife, and two bystanders who just happened to be there. One of them happened to be a retired, a flight nurse with military, Marines. something. So we just did CPR for about 15 minutes. Uh, he was totally blue. Uh, life flight, they, they got there and he had a pulse when the, when the paramedics showed up. Um, life flight flew in the primary children's. And to be honest, the doctors really didn't give him much chance. Yeah. It, not at all. And, I was hesitant to come forward with my name, but it was getting out there. You know, they knew it was a retired park ranger, blah, blah, blah. And God just said, you know what? Do it and give me all the glory. And that's what I did. Every interview I did, every person I talked to, I said, you know what? It was a man upstairs. I wasn't supposed to be there. He put me in the marina for a reason. He gave me the skills to do what I did. And he gave me the courage to dive down and go into a truck that was eight feet underwater. And that's why I did it. All the glory goes to God. Simple as that. Uh, long story short... 
Paxson was in a coma. <clears throat> he woke up Friday morning. He left the hospital on last Thursday. He was in the hospital nine days, and he's fully recovered. Wow. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. You want to add, add anything? Okay. Here's what I thought was, was cool, because uh, we're in this series called Love is a Verb. Pastor Shane isn't here today. I, I think you figured that out. But uh, he's, he's away. But um, this series has been really good as, as uh, we've moved through First John and talked about the action of, of love. And I, I just thought this was a great illustration of love in action. Love is a verb. And I loved the team, how, how God used all three of you as part of this. And I was, just, I was just picturing, as I was listening and talking to, to Joe uh, originally, uh, it's like he dives down, he doesn't have any success, and he dives, and it's hard, and it's cold, and it's scary. And there's Kathy, every time he comes back up, you get back down there. <laughs> we all need some people in our life that'll do that for us, that keep us, because all these things work together, and Timber is part of this whole thing, uh, helping keep this little child warm and comforted and everything so fantastic great work all three of you and I, I love how God has gotten the glory in this I know that you received a presentation yesterday this was from the uh, yeah, four of us actually got this award the okay. grandfather the two bystanders and myself so. okay and uh, this this is Joe brought this for it this is from the Summit County Sheriff's Office life-saving award this was awarded to to Joe Donnell in recognition of your brave and heroic actions at Smith and Morehouse Reservoir that resulted in the saving of the life of Paxton Knight. And uh, that's really cool. And uh, amen. amen. It's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> now, I got a special treat for you because... Paxton wasn't able to be here today, but his family is here, his father, his stepmother, and aunt. Okay, you guys, would you stand up? Okay, if you stand up, Ryan and Christina. And Brianna. And Brianna. Girl. And Brianna's here. Okay. You can come up here. But yeah, let's, let's just tell these guys, uh, they drove all the way up here just to be with us today, and I, I'm so thankful for that. Here they come. They're coming right up here. So this is Ryan and Christina and Brianna. So it's awesome to have. We are now a forever family. Yeah, a forever family. We love you guys. Just give them a big, big. Oh, and I have, I have one more thing for you guys. I know Paxton wasn't able to, to be here today, but we had a little gift for him too. So you can take that to him and just express our love. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Well, love is a verb for sure. We've been in this series, uh, and I want to look at uh, a scripture this morning. Uh, I'm not going to go through, I'm, I'm not going to adhere to the actual verses that we're, that we're doing. We'll get back to that uh, on schedule next week. But I'm going to take kind of a little bit of a detour off of that. But I want to start with this uh, scripture. 1 John chapter 2, 28 says, And now, dear children, continue in him. Continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Amen. Hey, did you get to see the picture of Paxton was up on the screen? Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad that was Paxton. I forgot to mention he was, he, he was up there. Okay. All right. Well, um, we're encouraged to continue our walk in the life of Christ so that when he appears, when he comes back, that we will be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. We don't want to be ashamed. We don't want to say, oh, I didn't really live for you like I could have. We want to have that kind of a confidence. So we're talking a little bit about that today because we've been invited into an intimacy and a relationship 
with God. That's pretty amazing. It's not just believe in him, it's have a relationship with him. And it's made possible by what Jesus has done for us. He calls us into a living a life. Now, in that relationship, he calls us into living a life that honors him, and we learn to embrace the things that he values. In Romans 12, 1, we have a scripture that says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, so you're thinking about God's mercy in your life, in view of that, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And then Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I find it interesting that so many people get this this whole idea of following Jesus, they get it twisted up and different from what the Bible presents. Some people are under this illusion, and really it is a delusion, is what it is, that they have to do things to make up for the mistakes and the sin in their life. And so to them, it's all about trying to balance the ledger, you know? I want to have enough good things to kind of make up for the bad things that are there because there's, there's a big list of some of the bad things so I want to have some good things over here to balance that out and to compensate for the things that I've done wrong so life becomes this effort to, to do things so that God will take notice of me and be impressed and he'll welcome me and some of those things that we might be doing might be good things They would certainly include religious things, going to church, putting some money in the offering, or serving in some way, or being nice to people. That's kind of a big thing for some of us, (laughs) just being nice to people. But the Bible is clear that there isn't anything that we do to achieve God's love and his acceptance. Isn't that amazing? We don't earn it. We don't do something to make it happen. It's the work that Jesus did. He paid the price. He provided the way. And there is no other way. It's him. It's Jesus. And it's all his grace in our life. But here's another delusion that people get caught up in. And that is, well, since I didn't have to do anything to get saved, or even to stay saved, then I don't have to do anything, period. So I won't. And that's a delusion. So here's what we need to learn from God's word. When we follow Jesus and receive the new life that he brings to us, something changes inside. Something changes inside. And we end up with some spiritual fruit. We end up with a life that wants to serve God and honor him and to please him and to reflect who he is to the world. Grace is where we begin. It's certainly where we continue because we can't live the Christian life by our own effort. It's still grace every day. Grace is at work. God is supplying the energy. God's supplying the life. God is the one that's making it all happen. So let's, let's put some points out here for you this morning. First of all, life is a free gift of grace. Life is a free gift of grace. You didn't do anything to make it happen for yourself. You didn't have a vote. No one asked you, would you like to live? Didn't happen that way. No one asked you how tall you'd like to be. You had no input. You had a gift, the gift of life. And our spiritual life is also a gift of grace. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, we find this, we read this, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And this silences all the look at me, look what I achieved, look what I did kind of talk. No, because it's grace, it's what So we go on, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
So life is a gift. Spiritual life is a gift. It's all from grace. Here's the second thing. Grace has fruit. Say that with me. Grace has fruit. This may sound uh, a little bit strange to you because uh, we say grace has fruit and, and uh, you know, as we look at our own lives or we, we look at someone else's lives, it, I'm not telling you to judge, but it might be appropriate for it, us to ask sometime, I wonder if that person really is a believer because I don't see either in my life or someone else's life, I don't see the fruit of what that should produce in their life. And I'm not saying to be judgmental or anything like that. I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just, I'm just saying sometimes we can be a little bit confused because we read that we've been created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And the fruit of grace is good works for the kingdom of God. The good works do not save us. Nod your heads, you with me? They don't save us, but they're a part of our life. They prove the reality of the grace that has, we've received in our life. Hearts that, been, that have been genuinely impacted by grace are hearts that want to turn around and serve God who brought them to life. Now Jesus said this, you'll know a tree by its fruit. I don't know my trees very well. There's a few that I can pick out. But if there's fruit on them, it's a lot easier for me, <laughs> okay? It really helps because if I see bananas hanging on a tree, I'm just thinking, I think that's a banana tree. Okay, so uh, if I see apples, I'm, I'm just guessing it's an apple tree. If I see oranges on it, I'm thinking, someone said, boy, you're really good with your trees, uh, Dana. How did you know it wasn't a lemon tree? Oranges. <laughs> it's got oranges on it, so that's, that's how I knew. If your fruit is righteous and Christ-like, then I have a pretty good idea of what kind of tree that you are. And if your fruit is not righteous and not Christ-like, then I'm having a hard time figuring out what kind of tree you are. So grace has fruit, and the fruit is good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, grace is the engine that fuels a life of serving God. When grace comes into our life, it doesn't land in some kind of experiential, narcissistic, me-centered kind of a way. Grace hits us and blows up our life for God. That's what it does. It changes everything. So the next thing we'd, we'd look at is the grace produces worship grace produces serving the life that comes from grace wants to serve the God that gave the life grace awakens the dead heart to serve the living God and it doesn't just sit in our hearts and say this is very personal it's very detached it's very private it's just inside my heart that's all no that's counterfeit to real grace which is outward and productive and fruit bearing and visible so we want to move from the it's just Jesus and me to some, and something that's private and, and uh, you, you, know, you can't really see that it's there into this place of no, this impacts the way that I live and you'll be able to see that. So that God is working through me to bring about kingdom life to people around me. Something is happening as a result of my life. Because we're not put on this life just to have a nice, long, private worship session with God until he comes back. We're put on this earth to do good works. By the way, have a private worship session. Do it. That's great. But that's not your purpose. Your purpose is to shine for him, to let people see how good that he is, and to do the works that he prepared for us in advance to do. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they would see your good works and thus glorify God. Not see your passion, not see your deep journey, not see all of your wonderful knowledge, but to see your good works. James said, faith without action is dead. Faith without works is dead. Here's the third thing, works count forever. This is important. 
because uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 9, and 10 says this. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we're at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Now, some of you are thinking, whoa, wait a second here. That just, that cancels out grace, doesn't it? No, because grace is the only way that you get to heaven. But what you get in heaven is gonna be based on your works. So you get a reward in heaven based on what you do. Isn't that interesting? When you only get half the picture, you're like, well, I'm just happy I'm saved. I'm excited about that grace. I've got heaven locked up. I'm in. And and Jesus says, yes, you are in. Congratulations, by the way. I did that. (laughs) That's grace. That's me saving you. You're alive forever. But if you haven't lived a life that is doing those things that God prepared in advance for you to do, the good works, You'll be standing before him and he'll say, yes, you made it. Glad you're here. Glad you received the grace that I gave to you and and here's your prize. This little gift because uh, I gave you life, I gave you me, I put my spirit within you, I had a special purpose for you to shine and serve and make an impact in the world but what you chose to do instead was just become a narcissistic, me-centered, self-focused, I've got grace and I don't have any responsibility and you chose to live your life your way and spend your money your way and spend your time your way and be on the page that you wanted to be on and to do all the stuff that you wanted to do in life And this is your prize. I'd like you to come and get it right now. This is what you have to lay before me at the throne of grace, the one who gave everything for you. Here's here's what you have. See, we're all gonna appear before the judgment seat of Christ. This judgment seat of Christ, by the way, is not for the unbeliever. That's the great white throne judgment. That's where you find out whose name is written in the book of life. This judgment seat of Christ is only for believers. And uh, so this isn't about whether you get in or not. You're in. But this is the basis for rewards. And that's a big part of our life in Christ. There won't be any opportunity, by the way, to say, hold on just a second, stop everything. I gotta fly back to earth. I gotta do some good works <laughs> real quick. Okay, you're not gonna have that opportunity to do that. It's over, it's done. So you don't get the chance to go back and spend your money differently or your time differently or your abilities and your talents. You're gonna stand before him and he's gonna reward you according to what you've done in the body, good or bad. There's no condemnation. It's just reality. That's all. Here you go. Thanks for what you did. And somebody's gonna come walking by and they've got seven semi-trucks pulling in behind them. And they're like, get out, step out of the way, please. I got these trucks coming here, this way. And you're gonna be like, what is all that about? Oh, that's just my rewards. (laughs) What'd you get? I got this. (laughs) And you'll be like, why didn't somebody tell me? Guess what? I'm telling you. (laughs) It's September the 4th. We're at MVF Church in Heber. Somebody is telling you right now this stuff. So don't, you don't have the chance to say, nobody ever told me. We're telling you, okay? So all this reward that Jesus is going to give crowns, responsibilities, position, just stuff. And, and so we, we know this. So it's works that bring that kind of reward, okay? It's not getting you into heaven. It's what the reward will be when you're there. It's, it's what Jesus called laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Have you heard that? That's what we're talking about. It's called stewardship of everything that's been entrusted to you and multiplying it for the kingdom. It's called investing in forever by serving now. It's called doing something. That's what we want to be about. Number four, grace fuels our works. 
2 Corinthians 5, we read this, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So our motivation isn't just to get a bigger prize. Man, that's what I'm living for. No, that's backwards. We're not motivated by a bigger prize, but rather by the love of God that's been poured into our life. And we desire to say thank you to him and to be part of that big picture of what he's up to in the world today. We don't serve God because we have to. We serve God because we want to, because he's poured out his love. We don't serve God so that he'll love us and put his arms around us. We serve God because he already loved us and put his arms around us. And we're so thankful for that. And he treasures us. Now if that gets twisted around, then serving becomes a drudgery. I hope he sees this. I hope he's impressed. I hope he's satisfied. I hope he loves me a little bit more now. No, it doesn't work that way. He already loves you. He's already satisfied. He's wrapped his arms around you. And because of that, we say, oh, I just want to serve. So grace fuels our works. And finally, it's all grace, even our works. Colossians 1.29 says this, to this end, I labor. This is Labor Day weekend. So here we are, Colossians 1.29. To this end, I labor, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. It's all grace. He's active in our life. Throughout all eternity, you will never ever say, I sure wish I would have done less for God. You're never going to say that. Why didn't I spend less time on him and more on me? You're never going to say that. I wish I would have missed a little bit more of church and caught a few more soccer games or football games or sleeping in or whatever. No. You're not gonna do that. You're gonna be like, what a great choice I made when I put God first in my life. Why in the world didn't I do that more often? What in the world was I thinking? Why was I just going to church whenever I felt like it and sitting around not doing anything and investing in eternity? What an idiot. I think I've made my point. So let me close by just talking about a couple of people. First of all, here's a guy in the Bible who really inspires me. His name is Caleb. He was one of the original spies in the Old Testament that went into the promised land and, and he brought back a report to Joshua and he, he said, man, we can do this. We can do this. God is giving us this land. Let's go. So time goes by because of the circumstances and the unbelief of the people who, who didn't believe that good report. And so it's, it's later on, many years later, Caleb is now 85 years old. 85. How many of you are 85? Okay, not many of us. Uh, feel like we are sometimes, huh? When the Israelites moved into the promised land, there was this ton of work they had to do, battles to fight, struggles, opposition. And we might expect a guy that's 85 years old to say, you know what, I had my day. <laughs> Let someone else do the work. Uh, I'm tired now. That's not what Caleb said. He's 85, here's what he said. God has kept me alive for a long time. I'm not dead yet and I'm just as feisty as I was when I was 40. So give me the hill country that God promised. I'm gonna do battle against the forces of darkness and God helping me, I'm gonna win. Man, don't you love that? 85 and he's saying, let me at him. I am ready. That's so cool. You know, you are here today, I'm here today because there were people who went before us and worked hard and served. They served people that were here to establish this church and worked hard and served and, and continue to week after week. We're thankful for them. There was danger and risk and exhaustion and incredible dedication by a multitude of to people throughout history who made it possible for you and I to hear the gospel. So we treasure that. And we thank God for their service. 
One more quick story. Some of you heard me talk about my dad before. My dad is 89 years old, and he's a pastor, and he's still doing it. He's still pastoring a church. He's got a small church. It's uh, in northern Nevada, and there's probably 50 people or something in it, but, but he's going strong. And, you know, a, a few short years ago, uh, I was just listening to his routine, and uh, on Wednesday, he has a Sunday morning service, and there's a Wednesday night, and he prepares a teaching for Wednesday nights as well as the Sunday morning service. And So he's having this big Bible study on, on Wednesday nights. He would go to drive into Costco, this is scary to think of an 80-year-old doing this, driving into Costco is the next town, okay, and buying food and bringing it back, and then he would cook the food, and he set up, he rolled out these big tables, and he set them up, and they put the chairs around them, and he prepared all the teaching, and he did this, and he did this every week. And I'm listening to this, and my dad's in his 80s, and I said, Dad, hello, do you know how old you are? This is, that's insane. You shouldn't be doing that. Why do you work that hard? Why are you doing all these things? And he just looked at me and he started crying. He said, how could I not? After all he's done for me. See, that's somebody that gets it. And I just walk away, wow. <laughs> Think about all the times I've complained. <laughs> All the times I thought, oh, I worked hard enough, you know. How can we not after all that he's done for us? That's what serving is. So I would encourage you in, in your Christian life to take those steps forward to get involved, find a place to serve, not because you have to, not because it's gonna make God love you, but because he has loved you, because of everything he's done for you. Now let's serve him with our lives. Father, we thank you so much for our time together and love is a verb and love serves and we wanna be involved in that. Touch our hearts, Lord. Stir us to do some things that make a difference for all eternity. Help us to be able to stand before you unashamed at your coming and uh, just to, to achieve everything that you have purposed for us, to live with a light that shines for people around us. In Jesus' name.